Hi, this is Paul, and this is part two of the video I'm making on Jordan Peterson and the history of the Christian God. Uh, this, this has to do with the death and resurrection video that Peterson did, and it also has to do with some of his early biblical lecture videos, really all of his biblical lecture videos, in terms of what Jordan Peterson means by God, what is the history of this God, why are there... Um, why are there philosophical conflicts and frame conflicts between, say, Peterson and Dillahunte or the upcoming conversation that we're going to see between Peterson and Sam Harris? Why, for example, Sam Harris and Bart Ehrman could get along so well, but with Peterson, there's going to be conflict even, well, again, that's why I'm making all these videos. And I, I started talking a little bit about the Why I'm a Christian video. Uh, what do you believe in God? What do you mean believe means? What do you mean God means? And that's that's the that's the real hard part here. And so <clears throat> we talked about in the last video. I want <clears throat> still working on my throat. I warned you in the last video that um, this is going to be a long one. So we talked about the polytheistic roots of the Hebrew world. We talked about how the Hebrew prophets beat empire and polytheism, matter and God. And now we're gonna. <coughs> get into a little bit more about the Hebrews meeting the Greek. So now we're going to run up to the second temple. Okay, the second temple. Th those of you who know a little bit of your Jewish history or your, your Bible stories know that the, <clears throat> the Jews, they, so the northern kingdom is destroyed by Assyria. The southern kingdom lasts longer and the southern kingdom is eventually destroyed by Babylon. And there are exiles in a, in a number of successive waves that go up to Babylon. Ezekiel, I mentioned the Ezekiel Sunday school class that I've done. Ezekiel was one of the waves of exiles that went. He was a priest. That affects the, the shape of the book of Ezekiel. Well, eventually the Babylonians come down and the temple is destroyed. And more exiles go up. And they are in Babylon. Eventually, the Persians come and take out Babylon, and <clears throat> and Babylon becomes part of the, the larger uh, empire of the Medes and Persians. You get into the story of Ezra and Nehemiah. The Jews are allowed to return back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And I talked in the last video how this is part of the change between kind of the Babylonian mode of assimilation which is that we've got the best gods, we've got the best science, we've got the best culture, we'll try and make Daniel part of our culture. With the Persians, it's much more cosmopolitan, let a thousand temples bloom. And so the Jews are told to go back, rebuild your temple, reestablish your society, but of course be loyal subjects of the empire. And in the last video I talked about this theme of empire that goes through the Bible. Well, this is the period of the second temple. And, and this, this gets a little confusing because the temple is rebuilt. Now, when we get all the way to the time of Jesus, that is still part of the second temple period because what Herod the Great does is improve the temple and expand on the temple, but it's still the second temple. And it will be the second temple that's get, that gets destroyed in 70 AD, 70 AD. And so this is often why it's called second temple Judaism. The restoration of the temple under the Persians didn't measure up to the expectations raised by the prophets. Now, if you read, if you read pre-exilic prophets like, you know, the first parts of the book of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel is an exilic prophet because he is, it is written from exile. All of the promises of fulfillment are huge. So at the end of the book of Ezekiel, for example, you have this mountain and a city and a temple and, you know, a city on a hill cannot be hid. You have, you know, Winthrop's famous sermon when, you know, most important sermon of the founding of the, of the colonies, of the English colonies, you know, we are a city on the hill. Well, this was in Ezekiel, a city on the hill. This is, in a sense, New Eden and its vision of restoration. Book of Jeremiah, the knowledge of the Lord will be over the earth like the waters cover the sea. So it's it's this vision of, of dramatic restoration. People will be purified. They will finally fulfill the covenant. That's the that's the shape of the story. Well, they come back from they come back from Babylon. A remnant of the exiles come back. A good remnant stays up there in Babylon. And this is, you know, you've got the beginnings of the diaspora. The Jews now will begin to spread all throughout the Greek world and eventually into the Roman world. <clears throat> 
and they will flourish. Jeremiah says, seek the welfare of the city. And the Jews go all throughout the empire, and they, in fact, do flourish all over the empire. But Jerusalem doesn't flourish. And the, you know, there's a famous story where the men old enough to remember the old temple cry when they see the foundations of the new temple because it isn't anything like Solomon's temple. And Jerusalem continues to be a backwater place where there are feuding people. They have problems with the Samaritans who are the um, mixed race remnant after the Assyrian. Uh, the, the Assyrians took apart the northern kingdom and brought other peoples in. The Assyrians liked to mix people together so they couldn't organize and threaten the empire. That was Assyrian assimilation. Babylonian assimilation was bring the brightest and the best to Babylon, educate them in our glorious culture and our glorious religion, and then they will be faithful servants of the empire. It's much more Borg. You know, we will assimilate you into our, into our collective. The Assyrians missed things up. The Persians let a thousand temples bloom. So rebuild the temple, reconstitute the sacrifices, go ahead and pursue your religion. And, and then at the, the Persian Empire was a very significant empire, very stable empire, very important empire. And so the Persian strategy actually worked quite well. But for the remnant that returned back to Jerusalem and Judea, the, the expectations of the of the fulfillment after the exile from the prophets were not met. And again, as I mentioned before, this becomes a key issue in 19th and 20th century and now 20th, 1st century dispensational Christian theology. It might be an issue in, in, in Jewish Zionism. But so there's a lot of issues involved in all of this. But anyway, it is not up to task. And so in a sense, some of the post-exilic prophets continue the tradition of the pre-exilic prophets. They continue their admonition. We've got the book of Malachi, you know, bring your sacrifices to the temple. This is often a passage that pastors bring out to encourage their, their congregations to tithe. But then the prophets stop, and you have this intertestamental period between the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, and the New Testament. There's the 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 Jewish people continue to write during that period. Some of those books are in the, if you have a Catholic Bible, I think this is a Catholic Bible. People leave Bibles here sometimes. Is this a Catholic Bible? No, this is doesn't have the Apocrypha. But you've got these other middle books in there that the Reformation said these are good books to read, but they're not canon. So on and forth. So I don't want to go off into all those different rabbit trails, but you have this intertestamental period, you have the Maccabees, so on and so forth. We'll talk about them a little bit. Because the fulfillment didn't come, admonitions continue in the post-exilic prophets. Hope is kept alive. You have Esther and the, the rescue in the Persian Empire, the, the, the book of Esther, you can read about that. You have the Maccabean revolt, where they actually push out um, push out the Greeks for a little while. But the, the, the rulers of, of Judea are corrupt. They're very divided. Um, imperial domination is, is always a threat. And of course, eventually the Romans come, and now we see an empire the likes of which they hadn't seen before in the Roman Empire. But during the Roman period, diaspora Israel, because Israel now is, is throughout the Eastern Empire, and they'll go all the way out to Rome. And, and there will be Jews scattered throughout the empire. And only a portion of the Jews will actually be living in the Galilee or in Judea, where, of course, the story of Jesus starts to arise. But the diaspora Israel had, had learned to flourish within the imperial context. And the Jews and their religious exceptionalism have a degree of, should be of tolerance, not or tolerance, a degree of tolerance in the Roman period. And there's a nice, there's a nice link here. JewishHistory.org, Julius Caesar and the Jews, tell some of the story. You know, the, the, the nice, nice description here. The Jews were considered the porcupines of the empire. Um, ideally, they did. Okay, Pompey was a talented, ruthless general for the for Rome. He was the first Roman leader to understand that Rome, uh, that Rome <clears throat> could not successfully control the Middle East and did not control Judea. Even if Judea was merely a neutral independent, it would serve as a wedge between the northern empire in Syria and the southern empire in Egypt. Therefore, he looked for a way to get himself into power in Judea. Ideally, 
He did not want to go to war because the Jews, the Hasmoneans and the Maccabees, these were the, the ruling class that ruled since they kicked out the Greeks, had a fearsome reputation. The Romans referred to the Jews as porcupines. Just as a porcupine is an animal that even greater predators avoid, so too the Jews. Even if you ate it, you'd be sorry. The Jews had a reputation as difficult to fight in a war and impossible to govern. Moreover, the, Jews, the, the Romans viewed the Jews as atheists or non-believers. Anyone who was religious in their view had a God that you could see. Well, that's a little, this is obviously written from a Jewish perspective. The Christians were also eventually called atheists because, again, the, you, you, had no, you had no graven image of the Jewish God and you had no graven image of the Christian God. And, and so they were viewed as atheists. And as we talked in the previous video, they were also highly resistant to the polytheism, which was, again, the theological lubrication, the, the social lubrication by which polytheists worshiping different gods could get along. So this web page nicely tells the story of, of Pompeii and the, the, the Jews are warring factions of the Jews sent representatives to convince the Romans to side with them and not their opponents. The Sanhedrin, ever wary of allowing Rome in the door in history, would prove their caution warranted, sent a delegation saying Roman intervention wasn't needed. Pompey listened and then, and then took his time responding. 63 BC or BCE, he arrived in Jerusalem. The Jewish forces led by Hurricanus promptly withdraw. The forces of his opponent, Aristobulus, fought against Pompey and Hyrcanus. After two months, the Romans broke through and massacred some 12,000 Jews defending the temple. According to Josephus, and again, if you want to read an ancient source, the, the writings of Josephus are readily available out on the internet. The, the Jewish wars, uh, Josephus is a very interesting writer. He has his own point of view, but he's a non-Christian and he's kind of an aristocratic Jew who, who writes a lot of this story and tries to explain the Jews to the broader the broader Roman world. Um, basically, Judea becomes a becomes a Roman domination. Now you've got more, you've got more drama up in Rome. Um, the Senate back, the Senate of Rome back Pompey. Julius Caesar boldly marches his army across the Rubicon, the famous river that marked the boundary between Italy proper to the south and provinces to the north, so on and so forth. We have the Roman Civil War. Caesar comes out on top. But you've got you've got good old Herod, who is is a very smooth operator, and Herod be you know is able actually to change sides and ingratiate himself with the Romans, and he then becomes the puppet. He then becomes the puppet king over in Judea, who represents who represents the Jews, and he's the one that that remodifies the temple, and in some ways Herod. Herod wants to be considered a messianic figure, so he's the king of the Jews. Herod is not um, Herod is not a full Jew. He's actually an Edomite. He marries Jewish women. the The stories of Herod the Great are also famous. And again, Josephus is is fun reading for for some of that history. You've got this first century Jewish culture war again before the Romans took took over. There are all these these local factions vying for power. Well, after the Romans are in control, now you've got this whole, you've got this whole angst that the, the Jews had been having, religious, cultural, social, political angst that they'd been having for hundreds of years. How could the people of God be subjugated by these pagan empires? How could God allow, we are God's chosen people, how, why would God allow these other people to dominate us. You can you can hear a version of that in some of the angst of Islam, where you have this glorious caliphate history of Islam, and and then you have the fall of it after the destruction of the Ottoman Empire in World War One, and then the question: Why are the infidels so powerful, and are we so weak? Now, there's there's got to be something. If your politics and your religion are are so closely identified as you had both in the Jewish period and perhaps as you have with certain factions of Islam right now, how can the one high God who is so supreme allow his chosen people to be so persecuted? 
Well, if you pose the question that way, and you understand the Christian story, and you understand the path of the Messiah himself, you can see how Christianity blazes a new trail out of that dilemma. But we're not quite there yet in the story. The first century Jewish culture war. How to survive the wait? When is the Lord going to come and vindicate his people and liberate his people? And when will Jerusalem truly be the umbilical cord between heaven and earth? And, and when will God establish his kingdom in Jerusalem? Now again, if you get into dispensational theology, and I haven't done a video that explains dispensational theology, but you'll find a fair amount on the internet about it. If you get into dispensational theology, they go into these kinds of things. And that's when you have uh, end times prophecies of the restoration of the temple and even in some subgroups of dispensational theology or um, dominion theology in the Reformed camp, which I am not a part of. I'm a part of the Reformed camp. I am not a subscriber to dominion theology. You know, maybe even the the reconstruction of Jewish, the Jewish temple and you know, this whole vision of Ezekiel coming true in Israel in today or in the future. So, you know, that's where all of this goes in terms of Christian um, Christian eschatology. I'm sure Zionists and some of the different factions of the Jewish groups have that today. Well, they're dealing with similar issues in the first century, and they they break out, they break down along lines that are rather predictable. You have the aristocratic pragmatism that says, well, we'll keep working with the Romans and we'll get the best deal we can. And as long as the Romans keep us in power, we're going to try and make this relationship work. And that's the aristocracy and a fair number of, you know, control in the Sanhedrin in Jesus' time who tries Jesus. That's, that's kind of the aristocratic faction there. And then you have the religious observance. Those who are, those who are very religious and very much waiting for the Lord, well, again, your options are limited, even if your factions multiply. One option would be the zealots, which would be kill the infidels and their collaborators. These are the hardliners. In, in today's terms, these would, be, um, these would be Islamists, or these would be radical Islam that wants to purify Saudi Arabia of, of any of the infidels and create the, the, pure, the pure religious state. And so the zealots are the ones who are actually trying to violently overthrow Rome and get the occupation out. They're a small, they're a small faction, and they're no match for the for the Roman army. You have the Essenes. They take almost the opposite approach. They go out in the desert and they live in caves and they stay out there and they're waiting and praying for God to nuke all of those dirty people who are controlling his holy land and all of their collaborators, the their Jewish brothers and sisters who were not as holy as them, so holy as to go out into the desert and to wait for God to come in and blast them. If you again, you look at the Bart Ehrman, Sam Harris podcast, Bart Ehrman will talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls were a group like this. They are out in the desert. They are practicing their religious observance. They're praying for God to come and, and nuke the infidels and all those other wishy-washy cousins and brothers and sisters of theirs who are collaborating or even just tolerating the Romans, the, the filthy Romans who are they're contaminating their culture, they're you know, drawing the young Jewish girls into prostitution, they're luring the smart Jewish businessmen into being tax collectors, and so on and so forth. This is the background of a lot of the Bible stories that you're going to find in the New Testament Gospels. So of the religious tribe, the, the, aristocrats, the aristocrats, they're willing to make compromises, make things work. They're pragmatists. The religious groups, you have the Zealots, kill the Romans, the Essenes, live in the cave and wait for God to nuke the Romans, and then you have Pharisees and teachers of the law, and they're in some ways kind of like the evangelicals. They're religiously observant, they're serious, but they're not living in caves, and they're not knifing Romans, they're playing a middle game, and, and they want to observe the law and resist symbolically and culturally. Don't collaborate, bide your time, persevere, await for the coming of the Lord, and by all means stay pure of the kinds of things that caused this whole long period of exile to begin with. Now, now pay attention that these people have long memories and are very patient generationally. We Americans, we are people of the moment. 
We pay little attention to the future. All we're looking for is my best life right now, my best life in this moment. Well, these are people with generational projects, and so they are waiting for, they're trying to remain pure, they are praying for God to deliver his people. Now, it's this context in which Jesus comes. And so in terms of the first century culture war, Jesus is in some ways closest to the Pharisees, but if you read the gospel, you'll find that Jesus is always sparring with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, probably because they see Jesus and they see the miracles and they see the power and they want Jesus to be on their side, but Jesus is not getting in, getting down with the culture war program. Jesus is eating, <coughs> eating with sinners and tax collectors. Jesus is doing all these kinds of things that don't fit the script. Now you have then the destruction of the second temple. The Romans come in in 70 AD. There's a, there's a, there's a Jewish uprising and, you know, kind of in the, in the style of the Maccabees, in a sense, they, they're going to throw out the Romans. Well, the Romans are not going to be thrown out. And the Romans come in with their, with their legions and they put it down. And, and like the Babylonians, they destroy the temple. And that breaks up there's a there's a big there's a big divide that happens at that point you've got really the then the the cementing and the permanence of rabbinic judaism the diaspora way of synagogues with torah replacing temple sacrifices that becomes the way of 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 judaism so that's one branch and then you've got jesus and paul and and jewish christians see jesus as the fulfillment of the long story of the Jews, and again, if you want to read um, up that, you want to read up on that in terms of a modern context. Read N.T. Wright's enormous corpus of work. Um, you've got the universe. You've got the universalizing of Israel's specific hope to into a world hope. So again, if you read Ezekiel, all of the fulfillment promises are about. Jerusalem and Judea and Israel once again being reconstituted in her land. And if you see in my Sunday school lessons about Ezekiel, I walk through a bunch of that stuff. What happens in the New Testament period is that Jesus is not just Lord of Israel and he's going to reign over the earth with Israel as his, as his proxy, but now there's a new kingdom. And the church, in a sense, in some places, fulfills the mission of Israel, and just as Jesus fulfills the mission of Israel. And so now it's a world hope. So if you compare, let's say, the end of the book of Ezekiel to the to the book of Revelation, this, this vision is one of, of the world. And, and again, you will find that. That's part of the important transition of the Old Testament to the New Testament in terms of the Christian Bible. And it's, and it's for this reason that Reformed, Lutheran, Orthodox, Roman Catholic do not go along with the dispensationalists because the dispensationalists, because of the modernist fundamentalist fight and their definition of literalism, and then that gets applied to Old Testament prophecy, they want to see the Old Testament prophecy fulfilled literally. Christians for ever since the first century have been saying, the fulfillment of the Old Testament is in the New. Well, what does that mean? Does it mean it's a literal fulfillment with Ezekiel's temple? No, it means Jesus replaces the temple. And, and the church fulfills the mission of Israel in a way that Israel never did. Now, again, this is, this is, these are long, 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 long conversations that are fraught with all kinds of complexity. And this is a great oversimplification, but I'm giving you my perspective. I'm giving you what I think is the, the dominant perspective of my tradition. So then the Apostle Paul, you, this new church develops out of diaspora Jews and then the Gentile church. And again, Bart Ehrman will make some reference to that in the, in the podcast that he had with Sam Harris. Now let's go back and talk about Roman Hellenism. Because the Romans were pragmatists who knew a good thing when they saw it. And the Hellenism of the Eastern Empire endured in language. In fact, 
Greek continues to endure in the eastern part of the empire. Latin is the dominant empire in the western part of the empire. And when you look at later on the difference between the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Latin Roman Church, there you have the roots of this here in the, Rome, in the ancient Roman Empire. Hellenism of the Eastern Empire endured in language, thought, and culture after the Romans supplanted politically the divided Greek Empire. And the Rome, Rome captures Greece, but Hellenism captures Rome. And this is kind of Jordan Peterson's ideas. Ideas have people, baby. So now you've got the Greeks and their gods, and we talked about them a little bit in the first video. The Greeks keep, the Greeks keep working at their religious system, but it's layered now. This, this, old, this old system of Greek gods, I mean, we're talking way before Christ now. The Greeks continued to think about this, and you have this, these various philosophical traditions that for a long time, for example, if you read Plato's Republic, you'll keep reading about the gods and so on and so forth. And so Greek philosophy and Greek religion, you know, they, they cohabitated. And again, I talked about the how polytheism is one strategy for dealing with religious diversity and, and religious pluralism. And the same thing happens with, with philosophy. It might be that you're, you're philosophically minded, but your family isn't, so you continue to go to the the civic temple of your city maybe there's a family deity that you preserve maybe the romans come in and now you have to add another deity but philosophically you kind of look at all these gods and say well i'm keeping the family happy and maybe they're out there so on and so forth but my philosophical system is the one that i am truly invested in as a person and so the greeks develop all these other philosophies that will continue to develop in the Hellenistic world. And of course, once the Romans come in, will spread through to the Roman world. So you've got the transactional superhero religious context with temples, temples and sacrifices, etc. The Romans move in, and as you know, Jupiter and Zeus and the Romans kind of copy the Greek pantheon and take over a lot of this. But you know, the Stoicism, the Epicureanism, and, and various other cults and religions. The, the, the Roman, the late Roman Republic and early Roman Empire is a very fluid place religiously. Lots of religious stuff going on all the time. There are mystery cults, there are temple worship, there are philosophies. It's a very live, it's a very live atmosphere, and this is the place in which the early church grows. Now, doing a little yeah buddhism to Bart Ehrman, I mean, he mentioned that, and he's quite right, that it was, you had these God-fearing, what are called God-fearing God Greeks. They're not actually ethnic Greeks. They're Greek speakers. You have these God-fearing Greeks that are in Jewish synagogues throughout the empire. And our picture of exactly what the synagogue system was like, it was probably way more diverse than we know. And so people are all over the map. Again, the, the context is a very live place religiously. Well, when Paul comes to town, there are almost always, read the book of Acts, it's all in there, are almost always fights with some of the Jewish population. But for God-fearing men and some women, you can read about Lydia in, in Philippi in the book of Acts, but for a lot of these God-fearing men that were kind of enamored with Jewish thought, Jewish ideas, the, the Torah, the ideas that they're hearing worked on in the Jewish synagogues, they, to become a full Jew if you were a man, meant circumcision. That's a big deal. That's not just a big deal because you're you're going to have a surgery, which is going to be you're going to have a high risk of infection. It's going to be terribly painful, but but status wise, it's also going to be difficult. So you have these God fearing men in the synagogues, and quite naturally, Paul Paul's teaching appeals to them because now they can, in a sense, become Paul's kind of Jew, and keep their foreskin. So. So the church starts to grow out of this context. Now, I don't think Ehrman fully, I don't know if Ehrman fully gets into all of the different reasons why this new Jewish sect that was Christianity is attractive to people in the Roman context. 
That, that's a very big question. It's a very interesting question. It's a question we don't know a lot of. And again, you'd have to read Clement and, you know, go ahead and read the patristics to get a, a bigger picture of that. We're going to talk about the patristics in a little while. But polytheistic religious um, pluralistic lubrication works quite well on this level. Civil temple, um, civil temple obligations, worship of the empire, practice your philosophy, it all works together. But philosophers ask more fundamental questions. They, they didn't necessarily displace the polytheistic religious world. In fact, that will endure far into the Roman Empire. But they had worldview questions. What type of place is the world? Now, it isn't that the Hebrew scriptures don't have this implied and asserted, but that wasn't the direct reflection of it. Certainly, there are implicit claims within the Jewish scriptures, but the Jewish scriptures don't necessarily address worldview in the way worldview is addressed. The closest you might get to it are in the writings where you get to Proverbs and the wisdom literature that tend to be a little philosophical, but they're not at all really on the same page or pursuing asking questions in the same way as the Greeks. And as we all know, the Greeks were an amazing people, and they asked a lot of questions that we continue to wrestle with today. And so then the question is, what happens when this, this Jewish offshoot, um, eventually kicked out of Judaism, new religion Christianity, meets the philosophy of the Greeks? And you get a little taste of that in the book of Acts when Paul goes to Athens. But it's, again, it's a very live context. So you've got common polytheism, which is kind of the first gear of common transactional religiosity. It's kind of your common people's religion. And to write, for example, says the two dominant perspectives in the empire are Stoicism and Epicureanism. And you can look both of those up on Wikipedia. Stoicism is very Greek. That You have kind of a virtual a virtuous detachment. And again, these are, there are a lot of permutations of Stoicism and a lot of brands of this. And there are skeptics and sophists and, you know, many, many other religious things. Again, it's a very live context. But, but kind of the big divide is Stoical detachment or Epicureanism, Epicurean indulgence. And again, if you want to research those, you can go ahead and do more research in, in, in those. But of course, Platonism and the writings of Plato, Aristotle, Plato, and Ar Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, I mean, these big three Greeks will, and their ideas will continue to influence and, and feed into these philosophical conversations. And, and part of what you get here is within Greek culture, and Platonism and Greek culture are very closely tied. You've got the world down here below of material decay um, and dependence upon the immaterial, but the world down here below is dependent upon the immaterial. So you have the forms above, and you have decaying life below. Every material instance of love below will end in death or betrayal. But love as an ideal doesn't decay because ideals don't decay. And of course, then you've got Aristotle later who will, in a sense, well, how do we know what horse is? Well, we look at horses and we can, in a sense, derive the form of horse, let's say, from the horseness that we see down below. And again, a lot of philosophy going on here. It's beyond the scope of this video. But cultural dualism persists and permeates many Greek philosophies that will come into contact with this Jewish Jesus cult. And, and it's in this area where you have this Greek dualism where this, this Hebrew physicalism really come into contact. And they're going to merge in some ways. They're going to bump up against each other in other ways. In past videos, I've talked a little bit about the Gnostics. The Gnostics basically reinterpret Jesus' story in the light of Greek dualism. And that was a... That was a really fierce heresy that the church almost didn't survive. And if, if Christianity had really simply bought into Gnosticism, it would have gone away. And we certainly wouldn't have, we certainly wouldn't be appreciating it here in our contemporary framework where the atmosphere is kind of flipped, where materiality is assumed and seen as foundational and ideas are assumed to seem as derivative 
if you're a materialist. You say, well, ideas are products of the brain. So material is foundational and ideas are derivative. Well, the Greeks were exactly flipped. And so when I talk to people today, I say, well, Jesus is the son of God. Well, Jesus, you know, and again, listen to Bart Ehrman and Sam Harris. Well, Jesus isn't God. Jesus was, Jesus was a man and you can't be both man and God. Well, in the ancient empire, to say Jesus is man and God, people could say, oh yeah, he's the son of a God, but a mere man doing miracles? I can't buy that. Now, modernists have flipped and you say Jesus is the son of God. Well, he's a man and stuff, but not God. I can't buy that. So you can see kind of the inversion that has happened. And then you have the question, well, Athens and Jerusalem. And there's some real tensions between the Hebrew God and the God of, of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle and those traditions. The Hebrew God gets involved, is emotional, takes sides, is responsive. This is accessible to common polytheists. And again, when you get into the celebrity atheists and their focus on reason, in, in some ways, even though they're kind of flipped because they're materialists, in some ways they're like the ancients in that they say, well, you know, we want pure reason. And this is, again, I mentioned in the previous video, part of the reason they will never win is that people are simply not built to be that way. People love their religion. Just watch people. Um, they'll go to a place and they'll want a little, I remember as a kid, I'd go to the Statue of Liberty, came home with a little statue of the Statue of Liberty. Why do I love statues? Because there's all kinds of human reasons for all of these issues that the church has fought over, that we fought over with religion. People love their common religion. And Jordan Peterson is dead on right. You make people rational, the new age, you take away Christianity, new age ideas will flourish because this is how people are. People are incurably religious and you can lecture to them and browbeat them about reason until the cows come home. They ain't giving it up. They just aren't. And, you know, you can have all kinds of highfalutin ideas in church about, well, we're going to do pure church and everything, and we're not going to have statues, and we're not going to have symbols. It's all going to be very cerebral. You watch. All this other stuff is going to be coming right back in, because this is how people are. And the Hebrew God, so if you listen to the atheist, the atheist celebrities, you know, oh, this can't stand the Old Testament with this Hebrew God. He's always getting angry. He's changing his mind. The Greeks couldn't stand this stuff. And just like, in a sense, the celebrity atheists can't stand this stuff. This God who smite the Amalekites and they go off and smite them. Oh, how immoral. Well, we do plenty of smiting in our own culture and the only real pacifists, the real ardent pacifists I know in the world are religious people. Well, that's not entirely fair. I'm sure there are some pacifist atheists out there, but most of the people who seem to be ready to die for their pacifism often are religious people. The God of these philosophers is an unmoved mover, and has um, a lot of abstract omnis, omnipresent, omnipotent, that don't translate easy, easily into the Hebrew cultural milieu. But this is what's amazing about Christianity, and C.S. Lewis talks about this in this book, um, A Severe Mercy, where he's he's conversing and and talking with Sheldon Van Auken, and, and C.S. Lewis gives a nice description of why he chose Christianity rather than Hinduism after he first became a theist. Because Christianity both deals with the daily needs of common religion. Give us this day our daily bread. Jesus teaches us to pray. And so God cares, and if your son asks for a ask for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? I mean, the God of Jesus tells us, call him father. He's involved in our lives. He's intimate. So this God scales. And we want a God who's passionate. We want a God who, as in Psalm 18, parts the clouds like a superhero and flies in and rescues us from evil. There is something really foundational in us that that, that grabs us deeply about such a God. As C.S. Lewis notes, we want a warrior and a lover, someone who will ravage us. And now again, you've got personality temperaments, and probably the celebrity atheists are way over on the cognitive side. 
in Christianity, you've also got worldview elements. And this is where the marriage and the, 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 the working through with, with Greek philosophy really kind of takes Christianity from this Jewish sect and puts it into a much more potent world religion. Um, and, and now again, what's, what's interesting is that this stuff comes into the church and into the faith theologically after the apostolic period, which means that they've got roots of it in the Bible. It's kind of like the doctrine of the Trinity. People will say, oh, is the doctrine of the Trinity in the Bible? And a good answer to that has been the doctrine of Trinity is in the Bible in solution. Well, what do we mean by that? It means it wasn't yet fully formed. And, and so what happens is you, you have this, you have the Bible, which becomes then the foundation, the, the Old Testament, the Bible of the early church, plus the teachings of the apostles. But you get into this next patristic period, and now Christianity has to defend itself against Greek critics and philosophical critics. And so you read these early church fathers and they're dealing with Greek philosophy and they're, they're doing theology and they're taking the, the basic materials of the Bible and they're constructing theological categories and traditions. And this is where you get the creeds develop. And, and the creeds are starting to say one God and three persons. And we're doing this in the categories of Greek philosophy. And we're talking about the person of Christ. Jesus is one person with two natures, a divine nature and a human nature, and they're not intermingled. And again, you read the creeds. What's happening in this, in this layer of church history with the creeds is that they're working through all of the, all of the issues with philosophy that are in the broader culture, and they're translating the apostolic material into those things. Remember what I talked about earlier in the first video? You've got the, the canon, preserves the diversity of the layers of progressive revelation, but theology then works on maintaining a unity within it. All right, and, and you see this tension often. Again, listen to the Bart Ehrman video. There's a lot of tensions to work through. I read this, I read that. How do we work that through? We work it through theologically. So, Larger structural um, narrative structure in which to have hope. So, but this basic structure of heaven and earth and the story of how does God redeem his world in heaven and earth, that provides a larger structure and that's very clear within the scriptures. And when you look at, say, how the New Testament is put together on top of the Hebrew scriptures, you can begin to see this long structure. Starts in Genesis, ends in Revelation. And you can see how the the patristic church is putting all this stuff together for us but its its roots again are in the bible and they're accommodating various philosophical approaches and you have this from origin to augustine so greek philosophy raises questions and offers systems that are clearly helpful and christian thinkers must answer Christian patristic period begins to do the hard work of Christians, God of the Hebrew Scriptures, living in the Hellenistic world, and they piece this stuff together. Uh, was it present in the apostolic period? Well, that's a really interesting question because, well, you have, you have clues to it, and so that's a very big debate in terms of biblical scholars. Christianity's evolved monotheism, and so that's when, again, if you listen to Philip Carey's lecture on on religion and philosophy in the West. Christianity, origin is dealing with Christianity and some Platonism, and Augustine and Neoplatonism. I mean, they're putting this stuff together, and, and now that, that does some changing in terms, of, in terms of Christian theology. And, you know, I would have a, I would be doing some yeah, but with, with Bart Ehrman in that part of the conversation. But, you know, you, and this is why Ehrman comes out of a tradition where it's the Bible and nothing, no creeds but Christ. If you're looking at Roman Catholic, Orthodox, Lutheran, Reformed, you, you embrace the creedal system. And so, for example, in the Christian Reformed Church, we not only have the Heidelberg Catechism, the Belgic Confession, and the Canons of Dort, but we also have the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and the Athanasian Creed. And so we stand with all of those churches around those creeds.
Christianity's evolved monotheism. It has already, it has already, it has already lived through the Hebrew prophet's subsumed polytheism. In other words, polytheism is already a, a an engagement of polytheism is already built into the Christian God by the time we get to the time of Jesus. So, so every time there's a polytheistic assault, it plays the henotheistic card, and the rival gods are relegated as subjects to Christ by his crucifixion and resurrection. You can hear Paul talking about that in the New Testament. Christianity also subsumes Athens in this way, though. It accommodates some Greek philosophy while meeting daily needs. Now, in other words, you, it, Christianity can replace the polytheism that, let's say, philosophical Greeks had to live with, and it replaces it with Christian, with, with Christian behavior and Christian morality and Christian worship, but, but it also integrates with tensions some of the ideas of Plato. And this is where, and this, this is an ongoing conversation. And again, if you listen to Bart Ehrman in that podcast, Ehrman makes the point that if you read the Bible, Christians are anticipating a new heaven and a new earth. If you listen to a lot of Christians just kind of out there, they'll say things like, well, the story is that we go to heaven when we die, and Christianity is about going to heaven and not hell. Well, that's, I don't see that as the biblical story. And there, this actually is a, is a pretty good conversation going on right now in the Christian church. And again, read N.T. Wright. Uh, N.T. Wright's book about the future. I don't have a lot of N.T. Wright books at hand here, but um, the Bible in the future, uh, Tony Hukuma, professor at Calvin Seminary, he walks through a bunch of the eschatology things. But this is why on Easter, I preach Easter, Jesus' resurrection. And we're looking at a physical resurrection. And this is where, you know, Jordan Peterson is on the fence because he's like, I don't know. I'm not going to say no, but I'm not ready to say yes. And that's why I call Peterson an open agnostic because he's, he's still kind of there on the fence. But what's interesting, I was, you know, a couple of years ago, I was rereading Dallas Willard's Divine Conspiracy, which is a wonderful book, a book I enjoy, and Dikaiosune, which is a big theme in the Sermon on the Mount. So if Peterson ever gets to the Sermon on the Mount, we'll have to talk about this. Jesus' account of Dikaiosune, or of being a really good person, is given in Matthew 5, 20 through 48. We need to stop for a moment on, on this special term that plays such a large part in the thought of classical and Hellenistic Greek culture, as well as the language of the Bible and the early form of Christianity that emerged to conquer the Greco-Roman world in the 2nd and 3rd centuries. The human need to... Well, this is Dallas Willard, and I remember when I'm thinking this, I'm thinking, wow, I'm taking Matthew, and and so then what I did after reading this was, again, pick up Plato's Republic. And because when I first looked at Plato's Republic as an undergraduate in college, I didn't know any Greek or not enough Greek. So I thought, I'm going to take a look at Plato's Republic and keep an eye on the Greek as I go through it. And so it's interesting when I'm reading Plato's Republic and I'm keeping the Sermon on the Mount in mind, well, some interesting things happen when I'm trying to think about well, did Jesus engage the conversation of justice, dikaiosune, which is often translated righteousness, in the Sermon on the Mount? Was he thinking about Plato? Now, one of the fun things that Dallas Willard does, again, Dallas Willard taught philosophy at University of Southern California. He was a phenomenologist, and he was also a, an important Christian thinker. Willard in the Divine Conspiracy takes these two worlds and put them together. And when I saw that, I was like, Wow, I got to really think through this. And, you know, the same stuff happens when Paul is at Athens. A lot of the time, Paul is dealing with the Jewish conversation. But increasingly, again, as you leave the apostolic period and get into the patristic period, you're more and more going to be dealing with the broader Roman world and the philosophy there. So, again, Plato, Dallas Willard mentions Plato's Republic and asks the question about justice. Um, the best translation of Dikaiosune would be a paraphrase, something like um, what that is about a person that makes him or her really good. 
For short, we might think true inner goodness. Plato, following Socrates, tries to give a precise and full account of what true inner goodness is. Read Plato's Republic. In, the establish, in establishing the central terms of ethical understanding, Aristotle replaced his teacher Plato's word dikaiosune, dikaiosune with arite, usually translated virtue. Historically, Aristotle won the terminology battle, and virtue has, more than any other term, stood on the ages of the heart of human righteousness and represents a combination of skill, wisdom, power, steadfastness for good that makes it very attractive. But now we're going to be in conversation with the book of Proverbs, the book of Ecclesiastes, Job, the, the writings of the Hebrew Scriptures. And so all of this stuff starts getting worked through, and, and it's out of this amalgam that that the unified Christianity that is shared by the Orthodox, the Roman Catholic, the Lutheran, and the Reformed all come into being. Now, I'm not mentioning the Anabaptists, the Radical Reformation, not because I want to exclude them, but because I don't know enough about them. Okay, so if you're part of the Anabaptist tradition, you know, forgive me. A lot of you probably don't know from where you from whence your tradition arises. There are a lot of Baptists that have reformed in the background. But then there was, of course, the reformed Arminian split. And so a lot of American fundamentalists really are of the Arminian split and then again into dispensationalism. And I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of modern church history, but all of that has impact in terms of how all of this shakes out. But now when we get back to Peterson and Dillahunty, what we're seeing with them is fundamentally a conversation. They're trying to talk about religion, but the issues that are really at play are philosophy. And this is part of the reason why Peterson frustrates so many people, because both Christians and atheists out there, the dominant philosophical frame in which they are thinking tends to be modernist realism. And so that's it's in that way that in some ways Dillahunty is like the Christians and why you'll have Christians, the celebrity atheists and celebrity Christians, going like this. Then Peterson comes along and it's like this. They're talking past each other. And we'll see if Peterson and Sam Harris make any more progress. But this, again, was part of the reason why when there was a lot of... of there were, there's a lot of anticipation about Peterson talking to William Lane Craig. Let me get it, because there's Craig Evans and there's William Lane Craig. And I don't want to get them confused. But when Peterson was talking to William Lane Craig, I pretty much figured they're going to talk past each other. Why? Because William Lane Craig is a modernist. So he's going to deal with Dillahunty, but Peterson's a phenomenologist. The, the conversation you really want to have is Peterson and Willard, although Willard is past, so they can't have that conversation. But Willard was a phenomenologist. And when you read Willard's writing, in some ways, he connects up with Peterson. Again, Dallas Willard got his, his undergraduate degree in psychology. And psychology and phenomenology have a very interesting relationship so that's the conversation that would have been fun, but we can't have that conversation because Dallas Willard passed away in 2013. But that's part of the reason I bring Dallas Willard into this conversation. So the Christian God. Now the Christian God has this long history built into him. Now I, I don't mean that, now some of you are alarm bells are going off. I don't mean that ontologically because the Christian God is the Christian God. but how we think about God and how God is viewed. And again, what hopefully you'll see throughout this very long, hopefully only two-part video, is that you've got a religious layer, you've got a philosophical layer, and you've got a cultural layer. And, and all of this history comes then into the God that Peterson wants to talk about with his phenomenology and the God that Dillahunty wants to talk about, Dillahunty and Sam Harris and others want to talk about within their modernist realism. But look at the Bible. Traditional Christian theology has a fair amount of Greek philosophy built into it at a very early level. And, and this gets very involved into debates quickly. 
Now, now again, when I mentioned earlier that in some ways Pentecostalism is not so much a theological slide, but a culture slide, it's also a philosophical slide because there are certain elements of Pentecostalism that are resisting and denying certain elements of Greek philosophy that came in very early with Greek Christian with with Christianity. And so when you look at the rapid growth of Pentecostalism around the world, places like the Dominican Republic, Africa and Asia, often into people groups that are traditional, people groups that never went through Plato. Well, it makes perfect sense that they can find an easy match but you're not finding an easy match with, let's say, Pentecostals and other people who see the world basically with Plato built in. So traditional Christian theology has a fair amount of Greek philosophy built into it, too. And these get involved in these debates quickly. The attributes of God, if you open up a systematic, a text of systematic theology, that's Freddie calling. Freddie calls me 10 times a day, so don't worry about the phone ringing. Usually I remember to unplug it, didn't unplug it. If you look at the attributes of God in a standard systematic theology text, those attributes are Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. You are trying to take the basic material of the Hebrew scriptures translated it into Greek philosophical language, and we talk about God being unchangeable. Well, that sounds like Aristotle's unmoved mover. And we hear God doesn't change, and then you read in the book of Jonah, for example, I remember reading that as a seminary student in Hebrew, and God repented of the evil he was about to do. And it might that translation might even be in the King James Version. So you say, well, wait a minute, I thought he's unchangeable, and here he changes his mind. And then theologically... People come around and say, well, it only looks like he changes his mind. That's the work of theology. Now, again, I know people like Bart Ehrman and Sam Harris might say, gotcha. And Christians say, no, there's no gotcha. We're taking the, we're taking the basic material of Scripture, which is Revelation, and we're doing theology with it. And Christian theology, Dillahunty doesn't seem to recognize, Christian theology continues to change. Now, how much does it change? Well, that's always a big conversation because we don't always know the ways that we're changing. But this is the confessional work that, let's say, in my tradition we do. We have confessions which, which lay some of our theological cards on the table. And we believe these are the books of the Bible and they're inspired by God and so on and so forth. You can read the Belgic Confession where Guido de Bray tries to explain to the tries to explain to the emperor why he shouldn't be slaughtering Christians in the lowlands or non-Catholic Christians in the lowlands. So, I mean, if this has a long, long, long history, you can't simply dispel the questions that the Greek world poses or even that the modernist fundamentalist split poses, which these are the questions that we're dealing with in the Jordan Peterson stuff. You cannot simply dispel the questions, even if they came after inscripturation you're using as your proofs, so you won't strip Athens out of Christian theology. And you'll see this happen often. So Pentecostalism will go through an entire culture and massive, massive, massive numbers of people will become Christians. And somewhere along the line, people says, oh, you know, we probably... Our pastors probably should have an education. And so what do they give them? They give them a book of systematic theology. Well, what's in that book in systematic theology? Well, there's a lot of Greek philosophy that's been baked into that theology for not quite 2,000 years. And so we say God is omnipotent. Well, you don't find the word omnipotent in the Bible. You find terms that can relate to omnipotence, and they'll find proof text for omnipotence in the Bible, but the concept itself is fairly Platonic. And, and this is the relationship that you see happening. So the evolution of Christianity. 
And this has been a constant process in the apostolic period from Judea to Rome. The patristic period is, in a sense, the conquest of Athens. The medieval period is the conquest of Europe. And I'm reading a book right now that was recommended in the comment section on the genesis of science, how we keep talking about the Enlightenment, but if you go back in the medieval period, they got their this stuff from somewhere. And basically, you have a long, long conversation about Plato and Aristotle and science and the empirical world and rationality and faith. All of that flourishes throughout the medieval period. And, and then in the late medieval period gives birth to, of course, the Renaissance and Renaissance humanism and the Reformation and the Enlightenment and post-Enlightenment. And before you know it, we're in the modern period and postmodern. And ta-da, here we are. So the medieval period, the conquest of Europe, the Enlightenment, which is a civil war in some ways, are the results of trying to get beyond the Roman Catholic Protestant civil war in Christianity. You have modernity, post-modernity, and of course, post-colonial period of world evangelization, which is in a sense the conquest of the world. And that's the period we're in right now. Now again, these, are, these periods take hundreds if not the medieval period you're looking at a thousand years let's say 500 to 1500 uh the enlightenment another 500 years these are long long times of course they're not long in terms of jordan peterson lobster time but they're long times in terms of human culture christ and culture issues you have to take into account the philosophical cultural context of a conversation otherwise you waste a lot of time talking past each other we saw that with jordan peterson and dillahunty and the videos i made about that if i were to sit down with sam harris and bart ehrman we would again i would probably want to take a step back and say well let's talk about the frame because that's, in a sense, it's going to be very interesting to see Peterson and Sam Harris. Now, Brett Weinstein is going to be in that conversation, too. And I hope they pay attention to the frame, because that's, in a sense, where Peterson is going to want to go. But, but here's kind of a pattern that happens in philosophical conversations that where one has displaced the other. This happens in religion, too. So if I sit down and I talk to a, let's say, a Mormon uh, Latter-day Saints evangelist that comes to my door, they would say, "Ah, but you Christian, you don't, you don't, you're not, you're not respecting the further revelation of the prophets." And I'll say, "No, my canon is closed at the New Testament." And if I sit down with a Muslim, he'll say, "Ah, but you're not reflecting the further revelation of the prophet Muhammad." I'll say, "No, my canon is closed at the New Testament." And if I sit down with Let's say an Orthodox Jew, I'd say, you're not recognizing the further revelation of the New Testament. He says, ah, no, my canon is closed with the Law and the Prophets. So this is a common thing. So Peterson walks into a room to talk to modernists, and they're just not buying this stuff. And, and that's part of the reason people with different philosophical or worldview backgrounds have a difficult time having a conversation because there's some basic things that just aren't coming together where Sam Harris and Bart Ehrman could sit down and have a lovely conversation because philosophically they're both modern realists. But how does revelation work with culture? That's a big, big question because John Calvin emphasizes accommodation because if god wants to connect with us he has to do so in a way we can understand now you could assume that someone like the christian god is multilingual and multicultural and can speak early 21st century american and 15th century or, or you know 15th century whatever anywhere in the world he understands our cultural filter. He can talk Iron Age, ancient Near East culture. He can, you know, the, the, the grappling with, with Moses and the Exodus was talking Egyptian culture. But what does revelation mean then? Well, revelation always comes incarnate, always comes within a culture. And, well, then what do we do when, for example, we have the Bible and we have to understand revelation within that culture? Now, I'm not a neo-Orthodox that wants to say, well, that's the residue of revelation. 
I am a, more of a traditional Christian, and I say it continues to be revelation, and I'm a Calvinist that says the Holy Spirit works to do to work that revelation into my heart. Now, that doesn't mean I'm infallible. In fact, I'm greatly fallible. If you don't believe me, ask my wife and my children. They have long lists of my fallibility. But at the same time, revelation, God continues to, now you're getting my theology, God continues to use his word, which is the Bible, as revelation to people. And the reason I don't want to go the neo-Orthodox route is because I, I think that stops it. And I don't, and and I think what we see happening all around the world is Wycliffe translators go into the jungle. They first learn the language of a tribe, then they learn to write the language of the tribe, then they teach the tribe to read. And all the time they've been translating the Bible, and they give them this Bible, and then that tribe starts doing theology, and there's no Plato in their theology, and there's no Greek in their theology, and there might not be much Western civilization in their theology but there's a theology within their culture. And I think the God and the Holy Spirit work with those things. Now, at some point, because of globalization, they're going to bump into the West. And so they're going to send their brightest and the best to school, and they're going to learn Plato, and they're going to learn Aristotle, and they're going to learn John Calvin, and they're going to learn John Locke, and they're going to learn Rousseau, and they're going to learn Kant, and they're going to learn Nietzsche, and they're going to learn Dostoevsky, and they're going to learn Kierkegaard, and they're going to maybe even learn Jordan Peterson someday. I don't know. But they then get pulled into the world conversation that is globalization, where you've got all of this stuff in the cosmopolitan space, all of these ideas, but they don't lose the cultural. It all gets brought in, in in how many different ways. Now, in the modernist fundamentalist fight, we saw a lot of concordism. Now, concordism is trying to figure out, okay, well, how does how does the Bible and science, how do the Bible and science relate? Well, that's kind of a hard thing. And some early attempts at that were to say, well, the Bible says day, but yom, maybe yom can be characterized as a long period of time so we can keep Genesis and we can keep science by trying to put it together. Concordisms come in various fashions. You could, um, you could make a case that the allegorical interpreting of Origen and Augustine were an attempt at concordism in a sense. Jordan Peterson is kind of doing a concordism with Darwin and evolutionary psychology and evolutionary development with the book of Genesis. And that's kind of, kind of what's really interesting about his business with Genesis is because Concordisms get popular because we've got this natural dissonance between, well, the Bible has, you know, this seven day, the, the earth is, it, the earth is made in seven days, not six, because in the seventh he rested, and that's the most important day, but we don't recognize that because we're reading it as moderns instead of ancients. John Walton, John Walton can help correct you on that. But we've got this Bible story, and then we've got all this evolutionary psychology, and Jordan Peterson helps put it together. So he's resolving dissonance, and we as human beings like our dissonance resolved. We like enough dissonance to keep things interesting, and we like enough resolution to make us feel comfort, comfortable and secure. So when Jordan Peterson takes on the book of Genesis, he is doing his own sort of concordism, and it's a very interesting one. I think at some level, certain levels of concordism are simply unavoidable avoidable, and probably necessary if you want the text to operate in your world. Now, after modernity, that's kind of where we're at now, some paths of post-modernity have simply been unfruitful and become covers for sneaking dishonest claims. That, of course, is Jordan Peterson's big complaint about postmodern neo-Marxism, that you start with postmodernism and say, we texts don't say anything, therefore, let's stand for the oppressed, and that will be our morality. Well, that's Jordan Peterson looks at that and says, that's a pretty arbitrary move. The world is way more complex. And off he goes on that part of the debate, and most of us have heard tons and tons and tons about that part of the debate. To me, that's not really the most interesting part of Jordan Peterson. Some of this other part, these other parts are much more interesting to me. But the way... 
Here's one way to think about how thought moves forward. And I think this is true of theology. This is also true of science. And this is also true of culture and sociology and philosophy, that people try different things. And in really big things, they try to live out different things. So right now, there's this vast experiment going on with respect to gender. We've got teenagers and young adults all over the place, people with male genitalia trying to be women, people with female genitalia trying to be men, people being post gender, uh, non-binary. There's this vast experiment going on right now. And of course, experiments like this make us all disturbed and give us a lot of dissonance. 30 years from now, what are we going to know? More than we know now. And, and let's say children who were so convinced they were a boy in a girl's body that talked mama into hormone treatments and even surgery, 30 years from now might look back and say, wow, I scotched my reproductive function and I will never have biological children. Was that a good decision? Some will say yes, some will say no. Vast experiments are going on. And what happens over long periods of time is that certain routes prove to be dead ends. And they prove to be dead ends on multiple layers. And this is where we're going to get into. I'm going to have more videos following this one. More videos following this one. You're taking hours of my life. Some of you like it while you drive. That's great. Here's my thesis. Truth must fundamentally, perfectly address every layer of reality. Materialism has been very profitable on a certain layer not nearly as helpful in other layers. Peterson comes back, is really kind of the attack on modernity, and says, you're not owning up to all of the ways you're not adequately dealing with these other layers. That's essentially what Peterson is doing. Now comes the question of the resurrection. Did Jesus come out of the tomb with a body? Did Thomas put his fingers in his holes? Now, what does that mean? Well, that's a question about layers. And if you listen to Bart Ehrman and Sam Harris talk, Bart Ehrman will say, well, the disciples saw something. And if you look at Gary Habermas with his essential facts walking back towards his, his arguments for the resurrection, he's basically saying, even Bart Ehrman now believes the disciples saw something. N.T. Wright, who is on the much more, you know, he's an Anglican, he's an Anglican bishop. N.T. Wright will say, they must have seen something because that changed history in a dramatic way that we can't account for any other way than they saw something. Well, what did they see? Well, if you listen to C.S. Lewis, well, at least start with honesty that they, they certainly are sincere about what they saw. Now, if you're Bart Ehrman and Sam Harris, you say miracles don't exist. Well, you've just taken one whole thing off the table. Well, and I would encourage you to read... Um, Oh, shoot, I should put these things in my notes. That's why I make notes. Huge book of miracles. Um, contemporary miracles, not just ancient legends. Contemporary miracles. Miracles, to, to say there are no such thing as miracles, well, that's not particularly open-minded, is it? Um, you've just taken a huge swath of, of reality off the table, and you've called the vast majority of human beings liars. All right you're going to have problems promoting your belief system amongst the vast majority of human beings who do believe in miracles. Now, all the ones who don't believe in miracles will cheer you, but that's a pretty small sampling of humanity, even now, never to, never to think about the rest of human history. So, my thesis, Christianity has to be true at every layer. A good, robust philosophical system has to be true at every layer. And so my argument for the resurrection essentially is if you have a Jesus who is not true at the material level, materially raised, you have a less optimal Jesus. Now, I'm going to knock on the door of the ontological argument soon, and some of you might see this coming. And the ontological argument is a highly debated thing, and we'll talk about that. But that's my thesis. See, Christianity has struggled with all of these layers as it's gone through history. Christianity has struggled with secularity. Uh, Nietzsche, of course, Christianity slits its own throat. Kierkegaard was dealing with corruption 
in Denmark and Copenhagen with Christianity. Post-Christian neo-paganism is back on the scene, and it'll be very interesting to see what happens with this. Again, these experiments last not just decades, but hundreds of years. And so for many of us, we're in the middle of the experiment and we're not going to see the end of it. Sometimes they get questions about um, same-sex marriage. Same-sex marriage is this massive experiment that's going on. A hundred years from now, 200 years from now, what will it look like if the Lord tarries? There's so much experimentation going on right now in our society, which means that there's so much dissonance in the water, which means, and Peterson is right in this, you're going to see a huge conservative pushback to all of this experimentation, but it's not going to be, it's not going to be clean and symmetrical. It's going to look like this. And so it's going to be a mess. Why do I say that? It's always a mess. Is the fever breaking of modernity? That really is my question. Um, a great book. Again, someone recommended this in the comment section, and I read it, and I loved it. Um, he makes the argument that, again, World War I was a major event in this in the history of modernism. And, and his argument was that Lewis and Tolkien, and again, I would in a sense... It, I do not equate C.S. Lewis with Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson is not the new C.S. Lewis, but they are. there are some similarities and they are functioning in similar ways on different aspects of this. C.S. Lewis is very much a rationalist, very strongly platonic. Port Peterson is a phenomenologist, more of an existentialist. So if Lewis and Peterson were to talk, they would bump heads on some of these things. Lewis sharpened his knives much more against the sorts of like Sam Harris. Those were the, his interlocutors that he debated with. And Bertrand Russell. These were the people that, that C.S. Lewis crossed swords with. So it's that modernity fight that in many ways Lewis took on. But Lewis, Tolkien, and Peterson all have this mythological approach which is the revenge of this other layer that has been ignored. Now, why do we see Tolkien and Lewis, and some would put Joseph Campbell, and then Jordan Peterson? What do we recognize when we find people repeatedly knocking on the door in the same way? Well, maybe there's something to look at. Maybe something, we can look at it through the lens of depth psychology, maybe something in our noodle. A lot of the watchers are saying, ah, you're ignoring these other aspects. You're not... Your truth isn't multi-layered enough, and you don't win by saying material is all there is. That, in my opinion, will not last, and I think we're seeing the fever break. Evolution at this level is measured in centuries. Jordan Peterson is phenomenology, the talk about consciousness, mythology. This is movement at the speed of centuries. But what we have in here is the enduring Christian God. And, and again, as I talked about in the Dillahunte, he is not just another object out there. He, by virtue of, again, some Greek, Greek philosophy built in early to Christian theology, is the ground of all being. But again, as Dorothy Sayers mentions in The Mind and the Maker, he is more similar, and you ask, what's our relationship with God? Sayers would say something like Tolkien's relationship with Frodo. Can Frodo know Tolkien? Well, that's a complicated question when you think about it. Frodo could only know Tolkien if Tolkien wrote himself into the story. And this is, in effect, what Dorothy Sayers, who's a friend of C.S. Lewis and a contemporary, she was also a mystery novel writer, this is, in a sense, what Dorothy Sayers says. God writes himself into the story. And Dorothy Sayers, in fact, has a novel in which she falls in love with one of her characters, and so she writes herself into the story so she can relate to one of her characters. And again, some of you might think, well, that sounds crazy. But when I listen to the fandoms and all of this stuff that my daughters are into, no, it sounds very much in keeping with the kinds of conversations that are going on within fandoms, within our contemporary trying to work through the gods. That's why, again, the superheroes are, in some ways, Greek gods. But this he is the ground of all being. He's distinct from pantheism. 
because he is personal, he has a will, he is active, he is interventionist, and he's available to personal relationships. So here you see God, the Christian God, working at all these multiple layers. Well, how can this God be known? Well, now we're going to get into Jordan Peterson's Easter series when he talks about sacrifice. And I'm not going to do that in this video. That's another coming video. This is more prolegomena in some ways. How can a limited natural being, us, recognize the supernatural? That's another video that's rummaging around in my head. Because if I were to ask you to describe the supernatural, first you would choose a whole bunch of stock terms. Then you would tell a bunch of stories. But if I were to really press that, the supernatural cannot help be clothed in the natural. When I say it that way, suddenly you say, well, incarnation. Read the rest of C.S. Lewis's book, Miracles. We'll get there. Jordan Peterson is a pragmatic Darwinian. Knowledge is limited to that which promotes continued survival. This is Jordan Peterson's definition of truth. Belief and knowledge is based on action. God is near God is clearly a, ma a major player in history regardless of ontology and that's part of the reason Delahunte is picking some of this up he's like you know what do you mean by God and Peterson again when he's pressed says I'm not quite sure what I mean by God and that's dissatisfying because we'd like Peterson all wrapped up in a box with a bow tie on top Peterson say, I'm agnostic about the resurrection, so I'm agnostic about the ontology of God. Well, that's the big argument in terms of Dillahunty's modernist rationalism, that, you know, God is a thing out there, and when we talk about God, we want it to relate to that thing out there. And, and in some ways, contemporary Christian systematic theology is also wrapped up in that. And so that's within that philosophical frame. The, ont the ontological argument in it isn't persuasive. persuasive. Now I could say, well, Jordan, um, the, gra the God greater than the one you're thinking of would be a God that actually exists. And you might recognize that from Anselm's ontological argument. Now, if you look up the ontological argument in the Stanford Encyclopedia, it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting article. In recent times, Curtis, um, Kurt Godel, Charles Hartshorn, Malcolm, Norman Malcolm, and Alvin Plantinga have all presented much discussed ontological arguments which bear interesting connection, connections to the earlier arguments of St. Anselm, Descartes, and Leibniz. Of these, the most interesting are those of Godel and Plantinga. In these cases, however, it is unclear whether we should really say that these authors claim these, these arguments are proofs of the existence of God. Most people won't go that far, because proof is a very high standard. Critiques of ontological arguments begin with Gaunin, Gaunilo, a contemporary of St. Saint, of Saint Anselm. Perhaps the best-known criticism of the ontological arguments are due to Immanuel Kant and his critique of prior reason. Most famously, Kant claims that ontological arguments are vitiated in their reliance upon the implicit assumption that existence is a predicate. Ah, Aristotle! However, as Bertrand Russell observed, it is much easier to be persuaded that the ontological arguments are no good than it is to say exactly what is wrong with them. And that's why it endures. This helps to explain why ontological arguments have fascinated philosophers for almost a thousand years. And this is where I think in some ways... When I first started listening to Peterson, I had the uh, my watchers were throwing at my conscious dartboard. Pay attention to the ontological argument. There's something there. There's something about the ontological argument and Jordan Peterson here because it's his theology of as if that. Well, live as if that. Wouldn't it be greater if if it actually were? Live live as if the resurrection were true. Wouldn't it be greater is if we actually believed in the resurrection? 
if you can have all of these imaginations of the layers of reality, wouldn't it be greater if all the layers were true? Now, obviously, this isn't dependent on all the layers that Paul Vanderclay can imagine because I can only imagine limited layers. The group of us can imagine more layers. The group of us can critique more layers. But what if, in fact, God knew all of these layers and more layers beyond and made his story good and true at every single layer? That would be a happy thing. That would be wonderful. And, and this is why part of me, and call me a Christian hedonist if you want to, part of me says, I'm going to believe in the whole thing. I'm going to believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. I'm going to believe in the Bible as the Word of God. I'm going to believe that I will one day be resurrected and I will reign with him in a new heavens and a new earth. I'm going to believe the whole thing. Now, you might be a nihilist and say, ah, you're not justified in believing any of it. And I'd say, if you're a nihilist, you can take your arguments for justifying this and that and throw them into the lake. I don't care. Because a lot of people don't care about what they believe anyway. They want to believe it because they want to believe it. Well, if you're going to play that game, I'm going to believe the best story I can imagine, and that's the Christian story. Because if it's a Hindu story, I lose my individuality. I don't want to lose my individuality. I want to maintain my history. I want Paul Vanderclay to endure. I want to believe that the Paul Vanderclay you know here is a tiny, corrupted, weak shell compared to the Paul Vanderclay that's going to be after the resurrection. I want to be that Paul Vanderclay, and I want to live in the new heavens and the new earth. And a God who could make this worth this world the way it is now with all the glory that I see, all the amazing complexity and beauty and power and passion and drama, what can he do if I become the kind of being that makes Thor or Iron Man look like a putz? I want to live in that world. Talk me out of it. Well, you're not being rational. Screw rationality. Well, you're not being reasonable. Screw reasonability. I want to believe in that world. And my postdoc writer on the elephant says, eh, let's take a shot at making that reasonable, making that rational. I think that's basically in my ontological argument. Peterson and the Logos. Logos has a rich history in Greek thought. Was John thinking about the Greeks when he made, when he wrote, when he wrote John 1, whatever John wrote it, however critical you want to be in terms of the Joannine community that wrote John 1, whatever, okay? Athens and Jerusalem, I'm about out of, out of energy, so I'm going to wrap it up. And my voice is about done. I've been talking all day, talking all weekend. i got to talk tonight. Sacrifice in the Easter talk, and that's where I'm going with this. This is, in a sense, a prolegomena to that. I've been re-listening to his Easter talk. We discover the future. We bargain with God, and it works. Well, why does it work? Why did it work enough that this, in fact, in terms of a competitive philosophical system, religious system, became universalized in the world? Well, if you're listening to the materialists, they'll say they're talking to nothing. Well, Peterson wants to construct a materialist justification that can reach beyond materialism. That's what he seems to be doing. Is it an illusion? But even materialists concede that accomplishments, you have the accomplishments of reason. And the reason C.S. Lewis begins with reason in miracles is he says, this is where the materialists and I can begin to talk. Because, again, listen to the Sam Harris, Bart Ehrman contact. You should play a drinking game how many times Sam Harris says reason. Play a drinking game when Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris are talking how many times Sam Harris will say reason. Reason is their God, okay? Reason is what the supernatural is clothed in, in the material world for them. That is what reason is, and that's why Lewis comes in and says, you want, you're denying the supernatural? Look at reason. It colonizes nature. It takes over nature. It dominates nature, yet nature is always in a fight with it. I think Lewis nails them. Because by this, we create the future. Reason, right? Which is a big deal for beings who live in moments of consciousness. Consciousness. 
What is the future? Future are more conscious, more moments of consciousness. Memory is in the reverse order. And this, again, is why I would argue if God knitted us together, body and soul, to have memories and brains, and my consciousness and my brain are intricately connected, and my material layer and all the other layers are intricately, intricately connected, then why wouldn't, in the best story possible, Jesus walk out from the tomb and Thomas can feel the scars? That's a better story. Why would you choose a why would you choose a lesser story? Well, because I want to maintain my rationality. Congratulations, there you go. You and that and your materiality will buy you the long dark sleep in the grave. Being, consciousness, and matter. These are the big issues for Peterson. What are the relationships between the three? These are at least three layers, or is being Peterson's word for all of the layers? You can talk about that. Christianity, because it won't let go of Athens or Jerusalem, keeps them together at the resurrection. Christ is raised into flesh that will not decay. And again, you listen to Bart Ehrman tell Sam Harris what the Bible says. Ehrman isn't totally wrong there. Okay, he's a legitimate biblical scholar. He's just got a different philosophical frame than I do. And again, if you want a good debate, you can find how many debates between Bart Ehrman and modernist Christians. You won't find a lot of debates between Bart Ehrman and phenomenologist Christians. Now we're going to have Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson talk. And I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a great talk. Christianity, because it won't let go of Athens or Jerusalem, keeps them together in the resurrection. Christ is raised into flesh that will not decay. The unity of consciousness and matter are not destroyed by death. That's what the Christian story says. That's why we knock on the door about resurrection when we talk to Jordan Peterson. Christianity is tremendously ambitious and optimistic philosophy and religion. It is unwilling to leave any level behind. Unlike Plato, it wants matter redeemed, renewed, and restored. That's Jerusalem coming in. Unlike the materialists, it wants consciousness and personhood redeemed, renewed, and, and, and restored. There's plenty of Jerusalem in there and a little bit of Plato. Peterson, however, as he said, I'm still an agnostic. <sighs> I wrote this outline on Monday, and I knew it would be a long one, so it's in two parts. So probably almost three hours between them. I can't quite see the little red line. So there it is. Let me know what you think. I should post them this afternoon. And yeah, if you got, you're got, you on for a good car ride, there you go.